Welcome, everybody, to this, the second of our nine lecture series, uh, The Origin Scholars, uh, presented to you by the Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of the uh, Case Western Reserve University College of Arts and Sciences and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and the generous support of Richard Morrison. <clears throat> Tonight's talk, Almost Everything is Dark, is the second in a three-part series on, in, on an introduction to cosmology. And I'm very pleased to introduce tonight uh, Dr. Evelyn Gates, the Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Uh, Dr. Gates got her PhD here at Case Western Reserve University and then went off to Yale and the University of Chicago as a postdoctoral scholar. She stayed in Chicago until re very recently, serving in various functions, including as Vice President of the Adler Planetarium. And we're very pleased to have her back here in Cleveland and tonight to talk about dark matter and dark energy. Dr. Gates. Thank you. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here and talk to you about dark matter and dark energy. And I should say, in addition to the other things um, I do, I'm also a cosmologist like Glenn. And so I've spent the last 20 years or so trying to answer some of the big questions about the universe. And I want to give you a little taste about this tonight. And one of the things I want to focus on is convincing you that dark matter and dark energy are real that we have good evidence for them. I'm not going to talk as much, although I want to tell you a little bit about how we are searching for these uh, strange substances that fill the universe. But since we haven't found it yet, you know, that's a talk for maybe next year. Um, so science always starts with a question. And one of the ones that I've been addressing and many of my colleagues is also one of the oldest questions humans have ever asked about the universe and the world around them. What is the universe made of? And the punchline is we don't know yet. But we do know that whatever it is, most of it is dark. And what's very exciting right now, there's cosmology is going through an absolutely incredible time. We have new data coming in from satellites, from uh, experiments underground, new theories coming in. And all of this put together with our recent observations have completely overturned our picture of the universe. What we know is that most of the matter in the universe is dark, and I'll explain what dark means in a little bit, and probably in some kind of exotic new particles, something we're calling dark matter because it doesn't interact with light. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't reflect light. It doesn't absorb light. And it's very different than what I will call normal matter. We also know that most of the universe is not in matter of any kind, but it's a strange new substance about which we know almost nothing other than that it constitutes the bulk of the universe. And we call it dark energy because it's dark, we can't see it, and it's not matter, so it's called energy. And that's uh, about the, the sum total of what's in the name for dark energy. But it's taking over the reins of the universe. It's driving the future and fate of the entire universe. So I want to give you a cosmic census. And this is also in the handout. I don't know if you got the... the um, things in a, if that's in the handout or something that you'll get towards the end. It's in there? OK. And, and this one is just to summarize. If you want to know everything that's in the universe, this sort of makes it clear. It's 72% dark energy, 23% dark matter, and less than 5% of what we call normal matter. And when I talk about things that are dark, how do I know it's there if we can't see it? And when I say we can't see it, we cannot detect dark matter or dark energy even with our most powerful telescopes. We can't use it, look at it, find it by um, using the Hubble Space Telescope or any of the radio telescopes looking in different wavelengths because it doesn't interact with light. But the first evidence that there was a dark universe came in the 1930s when Fritz Zwicky went out and looked at the motions of galaxies in the Coma Cluster of galaxies. And what he found was they were whipping around each other so fast that there had to be a lot of matter in this cluster of galaxies in order to hold them in place. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back to something that's a little bit more familiar and start talking about the solar system. So you can actually weigh the sun. You can determine how much mass is in the sun by observing the motions of the planets and the distance from them. So if I can find out where my little pointer is here, which seems to be completely gone. OK. so. The graph is showing you the planets in the solar system 
and I think there are still nine there, even though Pluto got demoted a little while ago. But if you look at how fast they're orbiting around the sun and how far away they are, they trace out this beautiful model based just on Newtonian physics. And that model, the dotted line, is actually um, what theory predicts for a, an object the mass of the sun sitting at the center of the solar system. And theory and data and those little tiny boxes are actually bigger than the error bars because as a scientist I always like to un understand how well I know something. We know very well how we can determine the mass of the sun. We just watch how things move around. So the other thing I should tell you, nothing in space is ever still. When you see images, you look up at the night sky and you see the stars, when you look at beautiful images of galaxies taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, those are snapshots. Everything is moving around and it's moving generally according to gravity how much gravity, how much mass is there, and it dictates the motions. So what if we want to look at the next largest object that we have in the, sol in the universe, which is a galaxy. This is a beautiful image of a spiral galaxy, much like our own Milky Way. And what you're seeing is stars and gas in this galaxy, a snapshot. They're actually, everything in there is whirling about more or less the center of the galaxy. It's orbiting the center just like the planets orbit the sun. So can we do the same thing? Can we measure how fast the stars are rotating about the center of the galaxy? And I think it takes, the sun itself is moving about the center of our galaxy. It takes about 250 million years to go around once. It, if these stars are moving around, how fast they're moving should tell us how much mass is in the galaxy. And when we do this, it doesn't work. So if we look at measuring the same thing we did before with the other, with the solar system, so we're looking at how fast things are moving on the y-axis and how far they are out from the center of the galaxy on the x-axis, what we find is the data are shown with their little air bars up on top, and if there were nothing but the gas and the stars in the galaxy, you would expect them to follow this line where they fall off, just like the sort of the motions of the planets fell off. That doesn't happen. We now have evidence like this for our own Milky Way galaxy and over 1,000 galaxies outside our own. And they all show the same thing, that it doesn't make sense. Gravity alone cannot be holding things in place unless there's a whole lot more matter there than we can see. So if we understand how gravity works and we think we've got good evidence, at least on these scales, that it does, we should expect to see the dash line that says disk, more or less, um, the data line. So let me stop right now and give you what's probably a politically incorrect image, because I like to sort of have some picture in your mind of why these motions and how does this make sense. Um, you guys probably all remember those merry-go-rounds that used to be in playgrounds, those little things. So imagine you're in the, in the playground and there's a bunch of, say, three or four-year-olds on this merry-go-round that's going around, you know, slowly. You know how tightly, more or less, they can hold on. Somebody's big brother's in a bad mood, runs over and starts whirling that thing and pushing it faster and faster and faster and faster. What do you expect to see? Small bodies <laughs> flying everywhere. It's, it's probably not politically correct, but it does stick in your mind. And that's the same thing we would expect to see in a galaxy. These stars are whirling around so fast that they should have been flung out of the galaxy millions of years ago, unless there's something else holding them there. So when, let's say, you look back at that merry-go-round, and the little kids, if they're going really, really fast, they aren't flying off you know that something else is holding them on. I don't know if someone's glued their sneakers to the platform or something, but in space, the only thing that can hold them there is gravity, and gravity means matter or mass, and that means there has to be 90% of the mass in these galaxies is dark. We don't see it. It's not in the stars and the gas that we can see. And we find the same thing when we look at a cluster of galaxies, um, just as Fritz Wicke did back in the 1930s. And Galaxies in a cluster, a cluster of galaxies contain hundreds to almost a thousand galaxies, depending on the size of the cluster. And again, they're not just sitting there, they're all moving around each other, not in nice orbits about the center of anything, but moving around. And what Zwicky realized immediately when he saw them in the 30s, they were moving too fast. They should have been flung out of the cluster millions or billions of years earlier, unless most of the mass in that cluster was in the form of some kind of matter that we can't see, dark matter. So that's sort of the introduction about how we first got hints that there might be things in the universe that were dark that we couldn't see directly. But to build a complete picture of the universe, if you want to get back to that cosmic census that I showed you, we need to start with what I think are the two spectacular successes of the previous century in physics. First is something called the standard model of particle physics, the basic building blocks of everything you and I in this room and the Earth and the Sun is made of. And we call it the standard model. Things are made of... Um, I'll show you in a minute the next slide. But we understand this really, really well. 
The second success was Einstein's theory of general relativity, which has had made many predictions, all of which we've been able to verify, including some extremely precise ones. And we take these two theories and now add in the data that have been coming in over the last two decades in cosmology, and we come up with something that's called the concordance model of cosmology, or that cosmic census slide that I showed you. So let's start with normal matter. We also call it baryonic matter, but the basic thing is normal matter is everything you have ever seen, detected, we have ever created in, at Fermilab or will create in the LHC that we've seen so far. And basically the idea is that everything you see in that periodic table of the elements, I put this up here um, just because I don't like chemistry in general, and I can then press this little thing and show you that that, <laughs> that shrinks down to less than 5% of everything is. So all that time you spent memorizing all that stuff, that's great, but that's not the, what's really important on universal cosmological scales. But what we do have, if we take a glass of water and you break it down into molecules, atoms, uh, protons and neutrons, which then are made up of quarks, all of that is normal matter. And anything we have ever directly detected is made of normal matter. And we've tested this model, we've crashed things together at our, our colliders, we've poked and prodded it, and it all hangs together really, really well. We really do understand these basic particles and how they interact. There are a few outstanding questions, but for the most part, we've got a good picture of it. Then if we look at general relativity, and this is also should be in the, the handout packet so that you can look back at this. This is a very brief history of the universe from the Big Bang to the present. The timeline is obviously not to scale, but it highlights a few key points that I want to make later on in this talk. Because in the case I want to build for dark matter and dark energy, I want to emphasize this doesn't come from one experiment, nor does it come from one kind of experiment. But we are making observations in different wavelengths of light using different kinds of telescopes and satellites and detectors and looking and probing different points in cosmic history. And all of this data comes together and all points to that same model that I showed you of dark matter, dark energy, and only a little bit of regular matter. And so in here, we're here at this, uh, the end of the big cone today, 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang. We now know the age of the universe to one decimal point. And to me, that's amazing. I was mentioning before the talk started, when I was in graduate school, we said the universe was 10 to 20 billion years old, somewhere in there. We now know it to within a decimal place, and we can mean that. And if we look back in time, sort of going back, we can see uh, other key eras that I will come back to in a minute. I'm going to flip back to this slide. Now, the next slide that I show is a little bit scary looking. You can either look through the lens or you can, you know, play along with me for just a minute. It's got a lot of stuff on it. But what I wanted to do on one side was summarize what I think are the key points of evidence that point to dark matter and dark energy in the universe. And I'm going to go all over all of these bullet points one at a time and tell you what I mean by this and how well we understand it. In fact, it even goes on to the next page a little bit. But what we want to start with, there are certain key points in the universe's history. 380,000 years after the Big Bang, I think Glenn mentioned, mentioned last week, something called the cosmic microwave background. And that's an important era in history because at that point, the universe was very hot. It was about 3,000 degrees above absolute zero. And it was so hot that atoms weren't neutral. You had a proton, you had an electron, and it was so hot that if they came together to form a neutral hydrogen atom, something came along and blasted them apart immediately. And because they were charged, that means light particles called photons see charged particles. And they'd go a little way, they'd see some, you know, a positively charged particle, and they'd go off in another direction. And the universe was opaque. Light couldn't travel very far before it interacted with something. But at 380,000 years, the universe was cooling, and it cooled to the point where atoms could become neutral. And at that point, the light particles, the photons, don't see anything anymore. It's a neutral universe. They just start streaming freely towards us. And that's going to be really, really important in understanding the case for dark matter and dark energy. Um, so let me go on ahead and start talking about this thing, and we will refer back to the, the points in time on that history chart of the universe. So the first point I need to make is that we know how much matter and energy there is in total in the universe. And that's shorthand. I need to be careful here. We know the density. We know the matter and energy, energy density. We don't actually know how big the universe is in total. So I can't tell you what the total energy is. The universe could be infinite. It's bigger than we can see, at least. Um, and I don't know if Glenn will touch on some of the um, overall size of the universe and, and how we can probe that next week. But we do know the density of stuff. We know the total amount. 
And what we do know, that first equation up there is actually uh, shorthand for Einstein's equation. And Einstein's equations, what he said in general relativity is that the way space is shaped and how it moves around depends on what matter is in it, what kind of matter, and how that's moving around. The two are totally interactive. And that goes for the whole universe itself. So if I know how much stuff is in the universe, I know what the overall shape of the universe is. Now the second bullet, the parentheses, almost looks like a typo. Instead of density, it's destiny, same letters. Um, we used to think that if we knew the geometry, if we knew what was in the universe, we would be able to predict its ultimate fate. That's not strictly true anymore because we don't know what dark energy is, and that's going to play a key role. It depends on exactly what that is, how much we can say about how the universe will eventually end. So that one's not quite true anymore. And ignore the rest of the stuff other than to say is, in order for the universe to have what's called a critical density, meaning that space overall is flat, and flat just means you can use the geometry you learned in ninth grade. Parallel lines will stay parallel even if you shoot them off across huge distances of billions of light years in the universe. Um, and there's no matter in between. The angles of a triangle will add up to 180 degrees. That's a flat universe. That's a geometry. So this is one thing that's hard to get your mind around a little bit. I wouldn't, if, if this is the first time you've heard it, don't worry if it doesn't make sense because space is empty. But we actually, I will show you a little bit later on, warping of space on smaller scales. And, and they're really beautiful pictures that illustrate this equation one uh, perfectly. But the idea is that the overall density of the universe to be a critical density, to be flat, is about five protons per cubic meter. That's not very dense. Um, and we sort of divide the universe possible geometries into flat, open, and closed. And here's something that might help illustrate that a little bit. So measuring the geometry of the universe involves, if it's flat, you've got the critical density, you have the flat picture in the center where um, the triangle adds up the way you expect it to. And a sphere, things are a little bit different. The angles within the triangle are, are greater than 180, and that's called a closed universe. That means there's more matter in the universe than critical. And in open dense universe, under dense universe, you would have the saddle picture at the bottom. Now, this is really important because it's this basic picture that allows us to measure the overall geometry of the universe. What we're doing is looking at something called a standard ruler. So on each one of these pictures, that line labeled L is the same length. It's also the same distance away from me. But when I look at the angle marked theta in these, it's very different in all three pictures just because of geometry. So what I want to do in order to measure the universe is have something whose length L I know, at a distance away from me I know, and see what angle it subtends. Because when I look at it, something like if I look at that clock on the sky over there, I can say it has a certain angle that I see it, and that's the size that I see. So how do we find something? We go back to the microwave background. So we're, the first key point is this um, image that you probably saw last week that allows us to matter, measure the geometry of the universe and therefore how much matter and energy there is in the universe completely. So when that says total matter, that should say total matter and energy. I'm looking at the universe. This is an image of the universe as it was over 13 billion years ago, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. That's kind of crazy to think about exactly how that works. But remember I told you the light is freely streaming from that point when it last scattered with the charged particles when they become neutral. When I look at that wall over there, I'm seeing the wall because light has bounced off that wall and then traveled essentially across the room to my eyeballs without anything else happening to it, more or less. So when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at light that bounced off the Big Bang itself, in a sense, that has traveled to the universe for 13 billion years until it hits my telescope or my eyes. It's got this weird oval shape because that's just mapping the entire sphere around the Earth. So if I look at the sky, the entire sphere that we live inside, that's projected in that particular shape. And what you see on this are little spots. That's a temperature map, hot spots and cold spots. Within, you know, one, the, the variations are one part in 100,000, very small. And the size of those spots is really, really important. The spots are caused because the early universe is this primordial soup of all the particles that could exist. It's a plasma full of charged particles, and there are things moving around in it. It's being stirred up just tiny, tiny bits, and it's being stirred up because of gravity. So again, gravity is making even this early primordial soup move around. And it's moving it around such that um, little places where there are just a 
few more protons or, or dark matter particles into someplace else, attract more, they fall into gravity, and you get places that are a little bit over-dense and under-dense, and that movement around stirs things up. Now, when I put into a computer a recipe for the universe, and I put in what the overall geometry is, and I put in sort of the amounts of things that I think are in the universe, and I stir it up around the, the way we see it, these are three computer projections on the top of what we expect those spots to look like. And on the bottom are the different cosmologies that they put in for a flat, an open, or a closed universe. So the typical spot size just depends on how fast, in a sense, you know, uh, normal matter particles can move through this fluid. We understand the physics of that very well. So that's our standard ruler. We know how fast they move through and how much time they've had to move. So we get a standard ruler, and we look at how big it appears to us in angular size today. And smaller would have been an open universe, closed would have been uh, uh, larger angles, but the angles turn out to be about a typical spot size is about one degree across on the sky. For, for comparison, the moon is about half a degree across on the sky. And it lines up per perfectly so that we can say to within a couple of decimal places, we know that the universe is absolutely flat. And that, in turn, tells us we have the critical density overall, so we know how much total stuff there is in the universe. So if I know how much stuff there is in the universe, um, how much matter is in the universe? And in order to that, I look at um, uh, clusters. But before I get there, let me talk about normal matter, the stuff that we're made of and everything else is made of baryons, protons, neutrons. And so when I've talked about this dark matter, things in a galaxy that are whirling around and we, they're moving too fast, we can't see what's in there, maybe it's just stuff we can't see very well. Maybe there's a whole lot of planets there or stars that are very dim, things that are just normal um, things made out of protons and neutrons. Why am I claiming that there's some kind of exotic new particles out there? And the answer is we've got very strong evidence that there can't be more than about 5% of normal matter in the universe. And it comes from two key points in time. One is the primordial soup. That's at about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And the other is even earlier, looking at um, uh, what was going on in that primordial soup itself. So here we have a can of primordial soup. And I actually have a can of that in my office. I haven't ever opened it. And it's been sitting there for about 20 years now, so I think I might not. Um, but what happens is at about one minute after the Big Bang, so we're going back even further in time, and basically you have the most, uh, you've got sort of protons around there, and you've got some electrons and whatever other particles might be, but you only have protons. You haven't formed any of what are called the light elements. Uh, helium, lithium, deuterium, which is a heavy isotope of hydrogen, because a, a proton and a neutron, again, things are too energetic. If they come together to form something like a lithium atom, immediately something else comes along and smacks it and breaks it apart. My analogy here goes back, again, you'll know that I have three kids by the end of this talk. Imagine you walk into a preschool and kids are building blocks and it's early in the morning and they've just had sugar, snacks and cookies and they're all running around like crazy. You build the block up but as soon as the tower is built, some other little kid comes along and slams into it and, and breaks it apart. So you're going to have towers built but they immediately go apart. It's a little bit chaotic. That's the primordial soup. The universe cools down. The kids get a little more tired and the ones that are still building up towers, there's nobody with enough energy running around to knock them apart again. So that's what's happening in the early universe. And how much you make of all these different elements, how the protons and neutrons come together, depend on how many the, there are around. Neutrons like to decay. You need to make sure that you, you know, form something before they have enough time, which depends on how many you have around them. And this says that only 5% of the universe can be in the form of normal matter, or we wouldn't see the amounts of lithium and helium and deuterium that we see in the early universe today. So that's called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. And the other um, piece of data that came in more recently was, again, from the cosmic microwave background, looking at 380,000 years when the universe was very hot. And you see these density perturbations. You see those hot and cold spots. Things are moving around. And how things move around when you shake it up depends on what the stuff is made of. So if you were to take a, a big vat of water and then a big vat of molasses and, and took some swizzle sticks and moved them around, you could probably tell which one was water and which one was uh, molasses just by looking at how waves sort of propagated through it once you stirred things up a little bit. So that's what we're doing. Again, we go back to that microwave background image. 
and look at, it's a little more complicated here, exactly how those spots are distributed and how many you have of different sizes and things like that. And that says you wouldn't see what you see unless the universe had 4.6% normal matter in it. So now I've got two pieces, one looking at the universe one minute after the Big Bang, another one looking at the universe 380,000 years later, and they both agree to very high precision. Normal matter, the stuff that is in that chemical table of the elements, is less than 5% of everything that is. So how much total matter is there? To look at this, I look at clusters of galaxies. Again, clusters are conglomerations of hundreds or even a 1,000 galaxies. But there are three main components, and this is going to be important later on. Galaxies and all the stars in the galaxies only make up 2% of the mass in a cluster of galaxies. There's a shroud of hot gas around them that emits x-rays that forms about 13, 15% of everything that's in the cluster. And dark matter, stuff that we don't see directly, is about 85%. And what we do is go, we go out and study a cluster of galaxies, which represents a fair sampling of the universe, the amount of baryonic normal matter to um, dark matter. And there should be the same as the universe as a whole. And that tells us, by looking at many, many clusters of galaxies, that the total matter density is about 28%. So if I put this information together, I've got matter inventory. We've got 28% matter by looking at clusters. That's a cluster that you're seeing right there. And, and basically, those bright yellow spots are, are the galaxies within the cluster. You can't see the dark matter, obviously. And I'm not showing you the hot gas in there yet either. Normal matter can't be more than 5%. It's about 4.6%. That leaves you with 23%, or the vast bulk of the matter in the universe, that's something that's not made out of quarks and protons or anything that we know, or all of our data would, would uh, look very different. 23% of the matter in the universe is in this dark matter. And the question is, what is dark matter? So uh, time to break it up a little bit. As a, as a physicist, I'm a little lazy. You know, the first thing I want to do is see, maybe somebody else has figured this out already. I go to Google, and I ask what dark matter is. And it turns out that Dr. Science got the same question. Astronomers tell us they can't find 90% of the matter in the universe. Just where is it? And I loved the answer, and so would my assistant, because this is all too true. Most astronomers can't find their car keys or their wallets, much less most of the missing matter in the universe. They spend most of their time searching for lost pens or pieces of chalk so they can scribble indecipherable equations on the blackboard. Obviously, they can't be expected to take care of mundane practical matters like storing the very stuff of creation. Besides, they assure us it's cold, dark matter, so it's not likely to spoil wherever it is. I'd find another profession to pick on. And Dr. Science nailed it. I mean, that's pretty much the answer, except for the fact we don't know what that cold, dark matter is. So when we think about dark matter, as a particle physicist, um, I told you that the um, that normal matter, that we know quarks and, and electrons and how they interact very well. But we know there's more. We know that our models, that there's missing understanding exactly how particles get mass and why there are three copies of things. And so particle physicists are always busy building models that have many more particles in them. And it's really, really easy to make something that would be a dark matter particle. It's not a stretch of the imagination. It's fairly easy. And we have several uh, leading candidates for these. And they go by wonderful names. So a WIMP. We think right now it's most likely that most of the matter in the universe is in the form of WIMPs, which stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particle. It's a particle that doesn't have a charge. It's uh, massive because it's much heavier than a proton, maybe 100 times, 1,000 times the mass of a proton. And most of the theories that people are studying involve some kind of supersymmetry, which takes all the normal particles and gives them an ending with an INO on it. So there's a Higgs Eno and a Wino and a, you know, all sorts of Binos and weird names like that. But it's a very serious subject. And it's likely that this is, this is one of the most uh, popular candidates for cold, dark matter. Cold meaning it could cluster into galaxies at the time when galaxies were forming. There are other particles, um, axions, which come from solving another problem in particle physics. There are particle theories that have extra dimensions beyond the three space and one time dimension that we see. And those often generate uh, particles, Kaluza-Klein particles, and things like that. But that, to me, is the most reasonable. If I were to place a bet with Glenn, I would be willing to bet that we, within 20 years, will have detected a dark matter particle and will know what it is. I just don't think it's, it's, it would be fantastic. Um, to find this, but I think it's a fairly straightforward problem. Modified gravity, I'm going to come back to in a minute, because I told you, if we understand how gravity works, and we look at these motions of things moving around, 
then we should be able to say that there has to be dark matter there. Maybe we don't understand gravity as much as we think we do. So we're going to come back to that one because that's also really exciting. Machos, I had to put that up, put that up there. Machos was a potential candidate for dark matter in our galaxy that I personally spent uh, quite a bit of time looking at. MACHO stands for Massive Astrophysical Compact Halo Object. That would be things like Jupiter-sized planets, dim stars that orbit about our own galaxy. Um, MACHOs have been ruled out. So the WIMPs definitely take the day. They can't be more than a, a small fraction of all the dark matter that's out there, even if they do exist. So before we go on to how we detect some of these things, I want to talk about something even stranger than dark matter. You know, I've made this case maybe too strongly that dark matter doesn't strike me as something totally crazy. Dark energy, on the other hand, is something we really don't understand. So in 1998, two teams of astronomers, astronomers went out and tried to measure at earlier times in history how fast the universe was expanding. I know that you talked with Glenn last week about the fact that we live in an expanding universe. Space itself is expanding. And what we expect is that gravity should slow the rate of expansion. So think of it this way. If you take a ball and throw it up into the air, what's going to happen? It goes up, it slows down, it'll come to a stop briefly and then return to Earth. Why? Because the Earth's gravity is, is, is acting on it. And even if I had super strength and took illegal substances or whatever and could throw this ball really, really fast, it would go up, it would still slow down before it finally escaped from the Earth's gravity. So if I could, I could get beyond the escape velocity. Okay, gravity is expected to have the same effect on the universe. We know there's matter in the universe. We can see it even in just the, the galaxies we see, plus all the dark matter. All of that matter is attracted to all of the other matter in the universe. That should be slowing the expansion down. So the universe is trying to expand out, but the matter is trying to pull it back in. So what we expected to see was the universe should be slowing down. And the way you test this is to go out and measure the expansion rate at earlier and earlier times and see how it's changing. We wanted to see that the universe was um, moving, ex expanding more slowly now than in the past. And what we found was the exact opposite. The universe is not slowing down the expansion, it's speeding up. And it's going faster now, the expansion, than it was a few billion years ago. So now the picture you have in your mind is you take an ordinary uh, golf ball, tennis ball, you throw it up in the air, you see it start to slow down, and then all of a sudden, and it's gone. And if this happened in real life, you'd just be standing there with your mouth hanging open. And I think that was sort of the collective view of, of the astronomy and physics communities in 1998 when we realized that the universe wasn't slowing down, it was speeding up. It makes no sense as we know it. Something has got to be fueling this expansion, and we don't know what it is. So um, I don't want to go too much into the, how we actually measure the expansion rate, but we use supernova as something in the distance universe so we know how bright it is. And just as if I st stood up here with a 60-watt um, bulb and someone stood you know, further away with a 60-watt bulb, you could tell sort of how far away we were by how bright it looked because you know the bulbs are the same brightness intrinsically. Supernova are really good standardizable candles, meaning we know how bright it should be intrinsically. You see it's going to look fainter to you, and that tells you that gives you a measure of distance. And essentially what these astronomers are doing were the same thing Hubble himself did in the 1920s, which was measuring how far away something is and how fast it's moving away from us. So they do the same kind of thing. And in the 1998, there were two groups that did this. They both found the same answer. The universe is expanding more slowly in the past, meaning it's speeding up. And this gives you just a, a brief uh, image of the expansion history of the universe. So time, billions of years from today, is, is um, shown on the bottom axis. And on the side axis, it would be um, either the distance away or the, the scale the universe. The, ignore that. It's, it's sort of distance in effect. And the little dots you see are plotted. And basically, they fall right on the line of saying that the universe first decelerated and then accelerated. And I wanted to throw this up just as a data slide, again, for those of you who are scientists in the audience, to see we now have uh, 307 of these supernovae, and they've been put all together on the same plot. The line that's drawn under that is the line that says the universe is about 72% dark energy. They fall right on top of the line. The evidence is very, very strong. Um, and this is, this is the piece of evidence that said the universe is accelerating. And that acceleration implies the existence of some mysterious substance. It's dark. We don't see it. It doesn't clump around a galaxy like dark matter does. 
so it's going to be hard to detect, but it dominates the universe, and it's now driving the ultimate fate of the universe. The universe is speeding up now. Um, will it continue to accelerate forever? Will it eventually slow down again, and if the dark energy somehow decays? But gravity is no longer in charge. And the important part about it slowing down, we've actually made these measurements far enough back in time, before about five billion years ago, that we saw the universe slow down. And that's really important. Unless we sort of saw that kind of thing, we'd have to rethink all of our ideas about how structures formed like our own galaxy. You have to have things slowing down so things can clump together, and then it speeds up again. And I'm going to skip over this last particular plot. But what I want to show you is the evidence for the concordance model. And you've got a sort of a, a more cartoon version of this in your handout. But the bottom line is that if I plot total matter density, that's dark matter and normal matter, versus dark energy density, what's fueling the acceleration? And these are from three different kinds of observations. And you can see they complement each other. And they're coming in the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of the Big Bang is there in orange. The supernovae data saying how the universe is accelerating is in blue. And the, the thing marked BAO is essentially uh, a measure of the total matter density, such as comes from clusters. There's two ways to measure this. They both give exactly the same thing. And that little overlapping region there is the concordance model. So when I'm telling you the universe is mainly dark, it's coming from all these different kinds of observations and measurements. And they didn't have to lie over top each other quite the same way. And the fact that they do is very strong evidence for this very weird model of a universe that is dark. So what is dark energy? This is the one I have to throw my hands up in the air and say, I have no idea. And neither does anyone else at this point in time. We know that it has to act in a very different manner than gravity. So instead of you know, having things attracted to one another, it's actually fueling this expansion. It's working, in a sense, in the opposite direction to gravity. We say it's got a negative pressure, which you can understand if you know anything about trees, for example. You know, there's a negative pressure at the top of the tree getting the sap up relative to the pressure outside, but that's a relative negative pressure. It's sort of the way you pull things up into things. How do you have a relative when it's everything that is? So we really don't understand what it might be. One possibility is that empty space itself has an energy associated with it. Einstein, when he first developed his theory of general relativity, found that his model, when he put it all together, implied that the universe was either expanding or contracting. You know, he makes a you, what you do is you make a model out of math, you turn the handle, and you see what it implies. And what it implied was this universe that was changing. He said, that's crazy. You know, obviously, you look up, the universe is what it is. It's always been this way. So he put another sort of mathematical fudge factor into his model to keep it from expanding or contracting, which is a shame because a few years later, Hubble went out and measured the fact that the universe was expanding, so he missed the opportunity to actually make this really great prediction. But what his, his model was, in effect, was that there's some kind of energy in empty space itself that will fuel this expansion. Problem is, we don't know what this vacuum energy could be. And if I take that particle physics model, the standard model that I was so proud of earlier, and say we don't understand how this works, that implies that the vacuum energy is either exactly zero. We can find fairly straightforward ways to, to find some method of making it zero. Or it's 10 to the 120 orders of magnitude too big. I throw in supersymmetry and do some other things. I can get that down to 10 to the 60th too big. So 60 orders of magnitude too big. That's really big even for a cosmologist. And we don't mind factors of two here and there, but this is totally out of line. <laughs> So we don't have any good physics that would explain this. It could be some kind of new energy field that's called quintessence. It might be a new theory of gravity. We know, for example, right now that we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. We don't understand how gravity would work on the very, very, very small scales. And we know that we, you know, Einstein spent the latter part of his life trying to understand some of these things. String theory is one possibility, although we don't really know how to test it yet. Um, but the idea is, at some point, we're going to take gravity to a new level, just like Einstein took Newton's theory of, of gravity to a new level. I don't like to think of him as displacing Newton. He just said, if you look in a bigger picture in other regimes, Newton doesn't work so well anymore. And that's what we're running into here. Maybe. Maybe it's time to come up with a new theory of gravity or something even stranger. Extra dimensions, we live on some kind of multidimensional brain that might be crashing into each another brain. I mean, there's a lot of really wild ideas out there. And Whatever it is, 
And this is the point that makes this so exciting. And when we saw those supernovae results and were convinced that they were right, re-energized all of physics and astronomy and cosmology because we told we have a new mystery. And it's really big because to find out the answer, it's going to require a new revolution in physics. We're going to have to re-understand something about the very fundamental nature of the universe, similar, I think, to understanding quantum mechanics or general relativity. There's, I, I, there's no way around it. So that makes it really exciting. For scientists, it's, there's nothing better than having a new mystery handed to you that you can define well enough that you have the evidence I showed you earlier to say, it's really there. Now go out and find out what it is. So how do we go out and find out what it is? How can we probe a universe? It's dark. You can't see it. We can't detect it in any of our telescopes. So how do we begin to look, for example, for dark matter? So this is a cartoon illustration, that sort of the spiral galaxy that we usually used to see. That's an edge-on view of our own Milky Way, for example, is embedded within a huge sphere of dark matter called the dark matter halo. Halo implies just a ring, but it's actually a sphere. And so if there are WIMPs right now, there are billions of them streaming through your body. So there are about 15,000 WIMPs per cubic meter in this room right now, and they're moving at roughly 200, 250 kilometers per second. They go right through us. They go right through the Earth. They are, in fact, um, it's not that they're invisible to us. We are invisible to them. They don't see us. Dark matter particles just don't see normal matter particles, and so essentially don't interact with us almost at all. And it's that almost at all part that gives us some hope of actually detecting one directly. So if we want to go out and find these things, not only do they go right through the Earth and us, they go through any detector we can build as well most of the time. So there are three main ways that you look for dark matter um, in, de in, in detecting a particle of dark matter. First is direct detection. You actually want to see a dark matter particle passing through your detector. And usually what happens is it comes and it jiggles in some way a nucleon as it passes through, and you need to measure the signal of that small jiggling of the uh, dark matter. And Case Western Reserve is, is leading the way in, in one of the new detectors called LUX. Um, and Dan Akarib and Tom Shute are actually leading this um, quest to measure a dark matter particle. And I think I gave you some websites that you might look at if you want to look at a little bit more. The second way you could detect a direct matter particle, if there is a WIMP, there's also an anti-WIMP. So I should make it clear that dark matter are not antimatter particles. Antimatter particles are part of this standard model of particle physics. We can make them out at Fermilab. They're produced you know, in nature in various ways. We know about antimatter particles. But you also know if you have a particle and it's antiparticle, and they come together, they annihilate. And they might produce a shower of energy or other particles. And if there is a WIMP, there should be an anti-WIMP. If there are enough of them close together in that halo that I showed you, and they, they um, interact with each other, they will annihilate. And so what we're doing is looking for that little burst of energy giving, given off by this annihilation process in the nearby galaxy. And the last way you might hope to detect one is through an accelerator, like the Large Hadron Collider that's just been built in CERN. So this gives you a, a brief image, a little cartoon of what happens if you want to directly detect one. First of all, there's a lot of other stuff floating around out there, so you have to put it deep underground or under a mountain so that the sort of dash lines show you uh, normal cosmic ray particles that get absorbed by the Earth. And you want to detect the WIMP in your detector 100 meters or so beneath the Earth. So the large underground xenon dark matter experiment is in the Homestake mine in South Dakota, and you don't get many events because it doesn't interact almost at all with anything that we can build our detector out of, but we're hoping to detect one. None has been found yet. Well, we're still looking. Indirect detection, one of the satellites that's up there now is called the Fermi Glass Satellite, and it's looking for the annihilation products, this little burst of energy that might be given off if an, uh, there are enough WIMPs and anti-WIMPs in the halo of our galaxy. There have been some recent hints in the past year or two that people are seeing a little excess of, of cosmic ray particles of certain types, but so far there are no detection claims. And the Large Hadron Collider is this 27-kilometer ring uh, beneath the mountains in Switzerland. And you're not probably going to detect a, direct matter, a dark matter particle directly within the Large Hadron Collider, but you might find a particle that's a supersymmetry particle. If you find SUSY, that's evidence that this is a good theory, and many SUSY theories also predict dark matter particles. So that would be um, not evidence for WIMP, but would be a really strongly in support of that kind of theory. The other thing you might see is missing energy. 
So you produce a WIMP of some kind in your, in your detector, and it just shoots out because it doesn't interact with anything else that you can see. And that's sort of what we saw with neutrinos, which are other subatomic particles um, that are produced in, in nuclear reactions. So we've got some experience with that kind of thing, and that's what we might hope to see. The next thing you might do is go out into the universe and try to probe the nature. This isn't direct detection using gravitational lensing. And I'm going to move through this. I think Glenn mentioned it a little bit last week. Basic idea, as I said before, if there's matter in the universe, matter in space and time, it's going to warp it. And when you warp it, you, you go from having that sort of nice, flat Euclidean geometry that we all know and love to, to having to work in curved space times. And if space curves, this is going to the lens that I just passed you around, light traveling through the universe near this object is going to be bent. And it's going to be bent by a lens made out of space-time itself, not a lens made out of glass, but it does exactly the same thing. And so this was the way that um, Einstein's theory of general relativity was first heralded. The first real evidence for this was he predicted that light from a star that was close to the edge of the sun, this is greatly exaggerated, should be bent by the suns, by the mass of the sun, and it should look as if the star was shifted into a different position in the sky. This was the 1919 eclipse addiction, uh, expedition that uh, was heralded as this new model of the universe and provided evidence for Einstein's theory. Now this is a, 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 a cartoon, um, this is the Goddard Space Flight Center Visitor Center, and what I want to do is put a massive object using my computer in front of this. And if I put mass in there that bends light in the same way that space-time would, what you see is that ring of light that you saw by looking through the glass. And also, the other thing I want you to notice is if, if you look at like one of the little galaxies just on the edge in the side of the tunnel, it shifts it out of its place in space and stretches it out a little bit. And that's really important because there are two different kinds of gravitational lensing we look for in the universe. One that makes those rings that you saw or the arcs that you could see by looking through that. That's called strong lensing. But there's also weak lensing, the one where it just sort of shifts it out a little bit and stretches its shape. So what happens when I look at the real universe? You were looking at a light through a glass. Now you're looking at a galaxy through the lens of a warped space-time. So these are just eight different examples. In the center, the bright yellow thing is a, um, a galaxy that's probably about two billion light years away from us. That blue ring that you see around it is not a ring in space. It would look otherwise like a small blue smudge. It's another galaxy directly behind the galaxy, um, the, the yellow galaxy, probably about twice as far away, another two billion light years or so further away. The light from that distant galaxy has been bent into a ring just like the ring that you see looking through the wine glass or through the lens that I gave you. We now have stunning examples of this. Um, and this is another cluster, that, that big long thing over in the side, the pink thing is called the dragon. It's not a long arc in space. It's about 300,000 light years long. It's actually multiple images, about five images of a galaxy that's been stretched and morphed into an arc like that, just like we saw with the Goddard Visitor Flight Center. And the reason lensing is so important is it doesn't matter what it's made out of, normal matter, dark matter, it just bends space. And when you bend space and warp space, light's going to travel through it. So this is a cluster of galaxies. Again, the bright yellow white ones are clusters of galaxies. And what you are seeing, those strange blue things, there are five copies of the same distant galaxy. It's like a funhouse mirror. It's been warped by this incredible lens out in space. And what we can do is work backwards saying, how do we start with one galaxy that's about twice as far away as this cluster and make a lens so that it would morph it into these five images so that we see that. And what you do is get an image like this. This is the first map of dark matter that was ever made from a cluster of galaxies. And what you're seeing here is sort of di directions on the sky, sort of up and down, left and right, um, on the axes. And then the amount of matter that has to be there to make this lens is shown in how high it is above there. And you're seeing an overall mountain of dark matter. That's sort of the dark matter, that 85% of dark matter around the sphere. And then those 19 little, there's uh, 118 little peaks there corresponding to the individual galaxies in that cluster. So that is what a dark matter lens would look like if you could see it. Um, let me jump now to talking about maybe it's, we can use this lensing to test whether it's modified gravity. Is there something about gravity that we don't understand? And there have been ideas, paradigms, Mond really isn't a theory, but it's, it's an idea that's saying maybe we can change how gravity works to explain why the, the stars move around the galaxy the way they do. And there's a way to test this. 
So in particle physics, where I started out, you get to crash things together all the time and see what comes out. That's what the LHC is doing. You take a proton, another proton, you crash them, to crash them together. In astronomy, we don't get to move anything around, but every now and then we get lucky. And what happened It was something called the bullet cluster is there are two clusters of galaxies, and they actually underwent a collision. And this collision happened about 100 million years ago, and so we've got a snapshot of this. Um, the centers are now a couple of million light years apart. But a cluster, if you remember, it's got visible galaxies. So what you're seeing here is sort of um, go to the center and go down to about 7 or 8 o'clock, and there's, a, there's those bright yellow um, orange objects. That's one cluster. And if I come up from the center and go to about 3 o'clock, you'll see one bright yellow object. That's actually the center of a second cluster. And they, the two of them pass through each other. Now, galaxies are so spread apart in a cluster that when they crash through each other, when they collide, they just pass through each other as if it's like playing Red Rover when you've only got two people on each side. They just keep on going. Nobody touches anybody. But there's that hot gas that surrounds, a sphere of hot gas surrounds all of those, and it gives off X-rays. So I'm looking at the same piece of sky in X-rays using an X-ray telescope. And this is what gave it the name the bullet cluster. And what you see is sort of the bright pink red there is where the gas is. Now gas, a cloud of gas, when it crashes into another cloud of gas, does interact. And it slows it down. Anytime you interact with something, it slows down how things move. So if you can see the sort of the one on the top right, which is, gave it the bullet cluster name, it looks like a bullet. That's a bow shock, just like you would get uh, shooting water, a jet of water through a pool of water. It's not quite at the same place where that really bright yellow um, cluster galaxy is. And on the same side, most of the galaxies in the cluster on the left side are further away. So it slowed things down. Now, what would happen if there's dark matter? If there's 85% dark matter in there, the dark matter also doesn't interact with itself or anything else. So it should pass right through itself, and it should lie right over top where the galaxies are. So if we have a model with mainly dark matter and some gas and galaxies, after this collision sort of separated things out, I should see the galaxies and the dark matter together. The gas has slowed down a little bit. And if there is no dark matter, on the other hand, we know that most of the mass in this cluster would have to be in the gas, because there's a lot more gas than there is uh, matter in the galaxies. So if I had some way to map out where all the matter in this system is, it will tell me if it's a new theory of gravity, because if all the mass is where the gas is, then I don't need any kind of dark matter or there isn't room for any dark matter. On the other hand, if all the mass is where the cluster galaxies are, that's telling me that most of the matter in there is dark, and it didn't interact with anything, exactly what I expect for dark matter. I do have a way to measure this. I can use gravitational lensing. And so in the blue, you see outlined where they found the mass. The mass lies perfectly on top of where the clusters are. So this simple collision idea has uh, the title of this, pro, I think, was Proof of dark, the Evidence for Dark Matter. It was a very strong title. Um, I think it's almost warranted. It's very hard to find a way, and, and Glenn will argue with me a little bit later on this, because people are still trying to find theories that might explain how most of the mass could be, dis, you know, gravitational lensing would displace exactly where you see most of the mass of when you know it's in those red things. So this is evidence that dark matter itself is not a new theory of gravity. Um, and so we can keep looking for WIMPs, which would make Glenn's other colleagues really happy because they're spending a lot of money and time building their detectors. Um, dark energy, on the other hand, and I think I've got just about one minute, the main thing to take about dark energy is it has two main effects on the universe because it works in a different direction than gravity. Number one, it changes the expansion rate of the universe. And number two, it changes how structures form. So early on in the universe, very early on, light was the main thing in the universe, radiation. Then it was matter, and now it's dark energy. And when dark energy is control, in, under control, structures can't form anymore. So clusters that we see, these conglomerations of hundreds of galaxies, had to form earlier in a universe with dark energy than they do without one, because they had to be in place before dark energy sort of put the brakes on forming new stuff. So I can look at how structure grows, how these things come together the, in the universe, and also the expansion rate. And, um, the trick with dark energy is there's no way that we know of, at least no theories that would give me a way to detect it directly like I can build an experiment to look for a dark matter particle. So there are two things we want, need to do. First, we need to look at probing the nature of dark energy by making more observations of the universe and how structures formed and how um, the universe is expanding. And second is find a brilliant theory. So that one I'm definitely leaving to Glenn to come up with a new theory. 
So there are a lot of ways to do this. And before I stop, what I do want to leave you with is um, an image and, and show you a, a sort of brief set of slides on what we're really looking for. If I could see the universe with dark matter eyes, this is what it would look like. It's a giant cosmic web of dark matter that's strung across the universe. That little bar in the middle is about 600 million light years across. So on the very largest scales, and the bright areas are just higher density. It's not where there's light particles. That is what the universe would look like. I think it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. This came from a computer simulation of the universe. Now, the way we can, what we want to do is trace out that particular web. And let me just go to this image. So a few hundred million years after the universe began, it looked like that. Half a million, or 500 million about 5 billion, and then today. So I'm going to go back to that again and just show you one last time while I'm talking. The universe started out roughly smooth. This is all the dark matter. And over time, gravity pulled the denser places, more matter into those places. So you start with this image of the universe, and you move to one that's a little bit denser. And then as time goes on, that's a billion years. And then after 5 billion years, denser. And then today, even denser. And exactly how that happens and at what times depends on what the universe is made out of. Dark energy is going to impact exactly when those structures form and how that web tightened up to be the universe that we see today. And so this last image is basically showing you um, a way of doing sort of a CAT scan of the universe. We want to actually go out and see what if we can find this web. And at the bottom, this was the first sort of tomography, the, the first CAT scan of the universe ever taken, it reminds me of that first ultrasound you see of the baby. When you look at it, it's like the, the technician is saying, you see the baby and the heartbeat, and you're like, you yeah, know. <laughs> so that doesn't look very much like a web yet, but that's because it's early days in our technology. It's going to get more precise. And that was made by using gravitational lensing, actually looking at how that web itself warps the space around it and how that changes the images of light we see from even more distant objects. So that's the wave of the future as we move into it. And the reason is, this is so important, I'm just going to leave you with this. Um, there was a dark energy task force that was put together to study this really, really important um, revolutionary topic of dark energy. And I'll leave you with this quote from the, the report. The acceleration of the universe is the observed phenomenon that most directly demonstrates that our theories of fundamental particles, fields, and gravity are either incorrect or incomplete. The nature of dark energy ranks as one of the very most compelling of all outstanding problems in physical science. And it's uh, absolutely true, and I hope I've convinced you that this is the thing to stay tuned and watch for for the next 10 or 20 years or so. Thank you.